This article caught my interest from uh, uh, Harvey Wasserman at ecowatch.com. Obama's nuke-powered drone strike on America's energy future, February 20th, 2014. Energy Secretary Ernest Manez has approved $6.5 billion to build two new reactors in Georgia. This will cost taxpayers an additional $1.8 billion. Described here as a nuke-powered drone strike on fiscal sanity. While Fukushima burns and solar soars, our taxpayer money is being pitched at a failed 20th century technology currently d distinguished by its non-stop outflow of lethal radiation into the Pacific Ocean. And it's not included in this article, but let's add what's going on in New Mexico right now and what's pouring into the air. Georgia state regulators are strong-arming rate taxpayers into footing the bill before the reactors ever move a single electron, which they likely never will. Sibling reactors being built in Finland and France are already billions over budget and years behind schedule. New ones proposed in Great Britain flirt with price guarantees far above currently available renewables. This new project in Georgia makes no fiscal sense except for the scam artists that will feed off them for years to come. It would be nice to say this is merely $6.5 billion wasted, but that's the tip of the iceberg. The Long Island Shoreham and New Hampshire Seabrook came in at 5 to 10 times their original cost estimates. Shoreham never made it to commercial operation, neither did Seabrook Unit 2. Should the two new reactors in Georgia, for which the loans are de designated, beat the odds and actually go online in the years to come, it will multiply its sunk cost by irradiating the, radiating the countryside and creating radioactive waste nobody can handle. Nor can it get private insurance to shield future victims and the taxpaying public from the inevitable disaster. The next commercial reactor to explode, joining the five that already have, will do damage in the trillions. Its owners will not be liable, and the people making this decision will never go to prison. But many along the way will pocket major fortunes from substandard construction, corner-cutting safety scams, black market parts purchasing, mafia-run hiring operations, and the usual greasing of radioactive palms that defines all reactor construction projects. If we take that 6.5 or $8.3 billion and invest it right now in wind, solar, sustainable biofuels, geothermal, ocean thermal, wave energy, LED lights, um, building ins insulation, and solar topian south-facing windows. Then we can dent our climate crisis. That's where the jobs are. There would be an all above all energy strategy that actually makes sense. There's a link on this website or I'll include it in the description. And there's included links for Harry Wasserman's site. Um, he's the author of Solartopia, Our Green Powered Earth. Links for that as well as a nukefree.org where petitions calling for the repeal of Japan's State Secrets Act and a global takeover at Fukushima are linked. Eco News headline, new study shows glaring differences between GMO and non-GMO foods. New studies conducted by scientists independent of the biotech industry are showing glaring differences between genetically modified organisms and their non-GMO counterparts. Substantial equivalence has benefited the GMO produce trade, allowing it to skip over regulations that would apply to other food products including uniquely processed foods, pharmaceuticals, pesticides and food additives, all of which require a wide range of toxicological tests and can be subject to legal limitations regarding safe consumption. These latest findings contrast the principle of substantial equivalence, which has facilitated the approval of GMOs and with virtually no protection for public health or the environment.
We felt that putting our users in mortal danger for a quick buck was the right move. The substantial equivalence concept introduced in 1993 by the Organization for Economic Development, an international economic and trade organization, not a health body, states that if a new food is found to be mostly equal to an already existing food product, it can be treated the same way as the existing product in respect to safety. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and Japan's Ministry of Health and Welfare typically base their GMO food safety regulations on substantial equivalents. No shit. There are many good reasons for consumers to feel unprotected by these regulatory policies, considering how flexible and open they are to interpretation for the approval of just about any kind of GMO submitted. Independent assessments of substantial equivalents carried out across the world have shown how this practice is not only inadequate but untrustworthy, and the new study confirms this. In April 2013, an Egyptian publication found that a type of Monsanto GMN corn showed substantial non-equivalence and toxicity when compared to non-GMO corn. A more recent study led by Thomas Bowen at the Norwegian Center for Biosafety tested scores of GMO and non-GMO soybeans and found them not to be substantially equivalent. For more info on this article, I've left two links in the description as well, Eco-Living and GMO Foods, for further research. Eco-Living lawsuit forces FDA to roll out pivotal food safety law. Following several courtroom losses, Food and Drug Administration officials announced Thursday they would settle a lawsuit brought against them by the Center for Food Safety regarding the much-delayed rollout of the Food and Safety Modernization Act. According to the CFS, the settlement agreement with the FDA sets firm deadlines for the agency to fully enact the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was signed into law by President Obama back in 2011. This is a major victory for the health and safety of the American people. First major update to the food and safety laws since 1938 must now be implemented in a close and in timely fashion, according to the CFS senior attorney. That means safer food for American families. Well, let's hope. The Food and Safety Modernization Act was passed to combat the epidemic of foodborne illnesses affecting one in six Americans annually. Under the original guidelines, Congress ordered the FDA to create the new safety standards within 18 months. After the agency failed to meet the deadline, CFS sued and the FDA argued that it could take as long as it saw fit to issue the regulations. In 2013, the federal court repeatedly rejected that position and ruled in CFS's favor, maintaining that the FDA had violated the law. So we have a federal court to maintain supervision to ensure that FDA uh, complies with this uh, new court-ordered agreement, so a good chance they'll actually complete what they're supposed to do. However, uh, I certainly question the quality that they're going to come out with for new standards in support of the nuclear activity that's going on and all the radiation leakage. You know, I don't expect a very accurate modernization act. Also bearing in mind they support GMO foods. They're safe, right? <laughs> What's so funny now? I sometimes just think funny things. <laughs> Eco business fossil fuel advocates continue attacking Ohio's renewable energy future. The latest good news about clean energy in Ohio is that the state ranks number eight in the nation for solar jobs. But despite this, 2014 has not ushered in a new era of civility or honest debate 
about the merits of Ohio's clean energy standards that require a percentage of Ohio's electricity demand be met with renewable energy and energy efficiency. Instead, Bill Shates, chair of the Ohio State Public Utilities Committee, started off the 2014 legislative session right where he left off last year with the misguided efforts to roll back Ohio's successful clean energy policies. Senator Saints spent much of January and February holding hearings on the Senate Bill 34 that would repeal Ohio's renewable energy standard. Similar legislation inspired by the American Legislative Exchange Council has failed in Ohio and several other states in the past. And while this bill isn't expected to make it out of committee, it does allow Senator Shates to provide a venue for more attacks by fossil fuel funded groups that make a living denying the reality of climate change and spreading misinformation about clean energy. So what's replacing Senate Bill 34 on the Public Utilities Committee agenda this week? A new version of Senate Bill 58, the same bill that Senator Shates tried to ram through the legislature last year and that was rejected by his own caucus because it was harmful to consumers and a huge giveaway to Ohio's largest utilities. We haven't seen the new version yet, but given Senator Shates' repeated comparison of Ohio's clean energy standards to Stalinist Russia, it's a good bet that it isn't friendly towards Ohio's growing clean energy industries. Senator Shates is promising devastating testimony this week. I appreciate the tenor of the conversations. Uh, I think it will actually yield results uh, before the end of the year, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody. Eco living, processing of diseased and unsound animals linked to USDA inspector shortage. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is under fire over its shortage of meat and poultry inspectors after the federal agency failed to properly inspect more than 4,000 tons of tainted beef that was shipped throughout the country in 2013. We felt that putting our users in mortal danger for a quick buck was the right move. The massive recall was announced earlier this month after nearly 8.7 million pounds of beef was processed from diseased and unsound animals. Originating from Ranchero Feeding Corporation in Petulama, California, the meat was shipped to roughly 1,000 retailers in Alabama, California, Florida, Mississippi, New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington. The Inspectors Union official, Stan Painter, who is president of the National Joint Council of Food Inspection Locals, said the lack of inspectors most likely played a role in the recall as workers were spread thin and did not have enough time to conduct a full federal inspection. Another prime example of industry cutbacks for the sake of profit and disregarding the health and safety. And that's all my eco news for today. Take care, live well, be wise. May God bless you.